honor to be um, a guest in this temple of civic life. Uh, thank to all the good people at Down Hall for making this possible, to my publishers, Paul Grave, to uh, the, the bookshop um, staff that uh, are manning and womaning the barricades outside. Um, okay, so my title, let me remind myself what it is. It's um, uh, Debt Crisis and the Future of the World Economy, or something of the sort. Permit me to begin by deconstructing my own title. I shall be arguing that there is no such thing as a debt crisis. There isn't a debt crisis in the United States of America. There isn't a debt crisis in Europe. And there is no such thing as a debt crisis in my own country, which is nevertheless being consumed by debt. You know the, the, the joke about two balloonists whose balloon has been blown off course uh, by hideous winds, and at some point they managed to um, uh, regain control of their balloon and they lower it above a farm. And there's the farmer that comes out and looks up towards the balloon, and the, one of the balloonists says, um, excuse me, sir, where are we? And the farmer responds, you're in a balloon. <laughs> and so the balloonist turns to, the, to his mate and says, you must be an economist. <laughs> Precisely accurate and hopelessly useless. <laughs> Describing what we're going through now as a debt crisis is precisely accurate and hopelessly useless. It's as, um, we have a doctor here amongst us. Hi, Steve. Um, imagine if you had a, a, a terrible case of a cancer patient in acute pain, and your diagnosis was that this poor person is experiencing a pain crisis. It wouldn't be particularly useful. Debt is a symptom, and it is a symptom of our generation's 1929, 2008, to be precise. It's what happens when a financial implosion begins at Wall Street, then it's transmitted to the real economy, and then all sorts of dark forces uh, break out, break loose, mm -hmm and they start dismantling the economic and social fabric of the global economy. These awful events happen once every hundred years. We were unfortunate enough, and especially our children, were unfortunate enough that we had such an event a few years ago, back in 2008. Now, let me be a bit more precise about the question concerning debt. In this country, um, almost the whole spectrum of political opinion is pinpointing debt, especially federal debt, as a major problem. And it is quite uh, provocative on my part to be saying that there is no such problem. But let me explain why I think it's not a problem. After 2008, what has occurred in this country, but also in Europe and elsewhere, is what I refer to as the Twin Peaks problem. One peak is this mountain of unsustainable, unrecoverable debts and irretrievable losses, primarily losses of the financial sector. That's the big one. one peak, huge peak. You look at it and you think, oh my God, you know, there's a debt crisis. But then there is another peak just behind it, which is of, uh, quite often not seen overshadowed, but it's just as tall. It's the peak of huge, gigantic, gargantuan savings with nowhere to go. You may not have heard of it, but the world we live in has the highest saving ratio in the history of capitalism, as we speak now. So we have accumulated profits and savings with nowhere to go, too fearful to be invested into productive uses, simply because of the crisis. So this is the Twin Peaks problem that I've been referring to. So when I say there's no such thing as a debt crisis, I don't mean that there is no debt, and that debt is not a problem. problem the debt is a huge problem, just like the cancer patient has a serious problem with pain. But it, it is analytically unhelpful to be thinking in terms of a debt crisis. We might as well refer to the crisis that we are going through as a savings crisis, as a, a crisis caused by too much savings. 
You, you've never heard any, anyone in Bloomberg or NBC or CNN refer to this as a crisis of a glut of money with nowhere to go, but it is just as much a crisis of a glut of money with nowhere to go, to go as it is a crisis of debt. Now, let's start, let's begin at the beginning. Let's talk about debt. Reading the mainstream uh, outlets, newspapers, or listening to idiotic stations like Fox, you'd think that it, would, it is possible to have capitalism without debt. Well, it isn't. Once upon a time, it was possible to have an economy without debt, or with debt that is marginal in terms of the role it plays. Look, recall feudalism. What was the process that led to the accumulation of wealth under feudalism? It began with production. Peasants worked on the land. They produced wheat. They produced corn, right? So production came first. Then came distribution. So the sheriff would come in, take a large part of that mountain of corn for on behalf of the landlord. Distribution between peasantry and the gentry. And then eventually you had financialization. Very mild, but nevertheless you did, because the landlord would sell in rudimentary marginal markets his surplus and with the money would indulge in some money lending activities. So that was the financialization. So you had production, distribution, financialization and debt creation. But financialization was, it just came at the end and was not essential for either production or distribution. With capitalism, beginning with the enclosures in England and the awful clearances in Scotland, what you had was the perfect reversal of that project, of that process, I should say. So, how is capitalism different to feudalism? Once the peasants were thrown off the land and they became landless peasants, some of them, very few, were kept on by the landlord and they were given the task of organizing production. Production usually involved sheep, whose wool was an international commodity once the international trade route, routes had been established, and wool was, would be exchanged for silk in India, and that silk would be exchanged for swords in Japan, and then those swords would be sold back in England for a lot more wool, and the whole thing would start again. So, the ex-peasant who is now running the show on a small plot of land handed over to him by the landlord would be acting as a proto-capitalist, an entrepreneur. Effectively, he would borrow money from the landlord in order to pay for three things. The rent of the land, wages, pitiful wages, but wages nevertheless, they could have taken the form of corn, but they didn't have to be monetized, to the um, ex-peasants who are now wandering in the countryside, knocking on doors, hoping to get employment because they don't have direct access to the land, okay? and some machinery for you know, shears, for, 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 for clipping the ship's wool. Right? So land, labor, and capital would be purchased or rented in advance of production on the basis of debt that the entrepreneur, ex-peasant, now has to the landlord. So debt comes first. Then comes distribution of income in the form of a, 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 a labor contract. You will work for so many hours and I'll give you so much corn. Before production begins and then comes production. It was the combination of this reversal of the order from having production followed by distribution followed by debt to having debt first then distribution, then production. Because this reversal in conjunction with the great uh, improvements in technology that unleashed the productive powers of capitalism and capitalism managed to produce immense wealth and at the same time produce poverty that had never been known before. So this, this is the, the contradictory aspect of capitalism. So debt is to capitalism that which hell is to Christianity. And something unpleasant but absolutely necessary. That doesn't work without it. 
Okay? So, in a sense, capitalism is about ecological economics, even though we don't even know that. And capitalists certainly don't want to hear it. It's about recycling. We heard of the term recycling back in the 1970s from the green movements, especially in Europe. But capitalism has always been about recycling. The process that I described is what? It's a process whereby the entrepreneur, the ex-president, who is now forced to be an entrepreneur, they didn't choose to be entrepreneurs, it was the only way of making a living once they stopped being peasants, would do the following, would use debt in order to energize the production process after having distributed income in advance of production by effectively taking his hand and pushing it through the timeline into the future, grabbing value that has not been produced yet. That's debt. Bringing it to the present, energizing the production process, producing the wealth from which he hoped that he would be able to repay the debt, the money lenders, later the bankers, cover for the fact that he had already paid wages and for capital goods, machinery, and hoping that there would be something left for him in the form of profit. So effectively, there is an intertemporal, that is all about intertemporal recycling. You take value from the future, you bring it into the present in order to create a lot more value so as to deliver the value to the future from which you took a part. The problem with this uh, process is that once you start it and it works and you make a lot of money out of it and, you, and history suddenly starts um, being measured in terms of years as opposed to decades or centuries, because that's what capitalism did, it accelerated the pace of history, both through technology and through wealth accumulation. The moment you start doing that, it's like having a machine that prints money. So you want to use it more, you know, faster and more intensely to produce even more money. Now, the, the, the trouble is that if you reach, overreach and you take too much value from the future to break it into the present, that is, you create too much debt, at some point you can't generate enough value in order to deliver it to the future. So your recycling mechanism breaks down. And there's a second problem, too. The places in which, and the regions and the sectors in which this dynamic capitalist process is managing to push the boundaries of technology and to create wealth. Those are the surplus regions. It started, for instance, in Manchester, in Britain, and in Amsterdam, in Holland, and it's always localized. So there will always be de deficit regions and surplus regions. So Manchester was in, in, in northern England was in surplus back then. Southern England was in deficit. Now it's the opposite. Similarly, you have California, New York State, Washington State being in surplus, Texas being in surplus, and you have Illinois, uh, you have the Dakotas in deficit. You have Missouri, which is your equivalent to Greece, I think. Um, <laughs> permanent bailout by the rest of the United States, I've been told. Um, and the thing is that whereas markets are amazing institutions, for allocating existing goodies, goods and services uh, amongst consumers, they are chronically bad at creating a balance between the deficit and the surplus regions, the geographical problem with the, the recycling, and intertemporary. Firstly, remember that if debt comes first, and then you have distribution, and then you have production, Suddenly, the money lender, who later becomes a banker, who later becomes Wall Street, plays a hugely significant role in this process. Because the banker is the conduit of that recycling, intertemporal recycling mechanism. And when they get an increasing proportion of the wealth produced as a result of their mediation of that process, and given that a failure of a banker is not the same thing as a failure of a steelmaker or a clothes maker, because if the bank fails, the whole thing collapses, like it did in 1929, suddenly there are two things that must happen, inevitably. One is the society will demand that banks were not allowed to go to the wall, and then when they're not allowed to, to, to go to the wall, then bankers are effectively given uh, a carte blanche to print money for themselves. And then the whole recycling mechanism breaks down, like it did in 2008. Now, 
It is often said about the European Union, and in particular the Eurozone, that we made a huge error in Europe of binding together disparate economies by means of a common currency. Well, this is not the very first time that this has happened. It happened in the United States of America. You have disparate economies in the United States of America bound together monetarily. I mean, Missouri and Washington State, I mean, they are just as different as Germany and Greece. But what is it that keeps the United States together? You had a great depression here in the 1930s. Things were awful. Steinberg wrote the Grapes of Wrath as a result. And yet, I don't believe there were any movement, moves, political moves, to get rid of the deficit states of the United States of America, like they are in Europe to get rid of Greece and Portugal and Spain and whoever else happens to be in deficit. The reason is that in the United States of America, the state the federal state in particular, especially after 1929, has stepped in and played the role of a regulator of surplus and deficit recyclings around the land. So, let me give you a very simple example. Since we're in Seattle and there's a Boeing here, and I believe that they are sponsoring the town hall series of lectures, when Boeing goes to Washington, to the Pentagon, for instance, to get in it, um, a contract for the next generation of fighter jet or drone or whatever, Right? They may get it, they do get it, but there are some strings attached. Like, for instance, that, you know, we want a factory that uh, builds the, the wings or the engines or something in Tennessee or in Missouri or in Arizona in the deficit regions. This is not an act of philanthropy towards the deficit regions of the United States. It's an act of recycling surpluses so that the surpluses of the surplus states can continue to be created, produced. Now, you may recall that in the 1920s, internationally we had the common currency. It's called, it was called the gold standard. So fixed exchange rates, it's like having a single currency. And that gold standard created a degree of growth together with the emergence of the great corporations like Edison, which allowed the bankers to run riot and to reach far too much into the future to bring value into the present and to recycle. And the result was the roaring 1920s, which led to the collapse of 1929, which was that generation's version of 2008. Okay. And when that collapse happened, what you had was unsustainable debts, irretrievable banking losses, a Wall Street collapse that infected the real economy, the collapse of the common currency, and Nazis in Parliament, which is what we have now in Greece, exactly the same, by the way. Okay? Now, the generation of the new dealers in this country that came to power in 1932 were exceptionally fearful of what would happen to the United States of America and to world capitalism after 1944. Because they very much feared that after the stimulus, which was the the awful stimulus that was the Second World War, was over with the emergence of peace, that the Great Depression would come back. So they had learned their lesson from the gold standard era. And they did what? They reconstituted, reintroduced a fixed exchange global regime. It was the Bretton Woods system, if you recall, where the dollar was the linchpin, and all the other currencies around the world were locked at a specific exchange rate into the dollar, but they did not repeat the error of the 1920s of just binding together the economies of the, of the world without having a mechanism by which to recycle surpluses around the world. Because it was that lack of a surplus recycling mechanism which brought about the disaster of the 1930s. And those in power in Washington in 1944 onwards were very acutely aware of the need of that surplus recycling mechanism. Interestingly, in the Bretton Woods Conference 1944 in New Hampshire, um, there was a big clash between the representative of the United States there, a certain Mr. White, and the British representative, who was uh, somebody that you may have heard of, John Maynard Keynes, the famous economist. Both of them agreed that the new global system of fixed exchange rates had to come with that which was missing in the 1920s, 
And what was that? It was the um, global surplus recycling mechanism. But they disagreed on, on what that should look like. Keynes, representing the dying empire of the British, the very much weakened previous dominant uh, country, was recommending multilateralism in today's parlance. That is, that we should create something like the United Nations or the World Bank, which is well instituted, and through representation, democratic representation of different countries on it, um, he, called, he referred to it as an international clearing union, what I refer to as a global surplus recycling mechanism. We should all agree together as humanity on how to recycle surpluses. And Mr. White, the representative of the United States, said, not only on early mate, um, it's our surpluses, you don't have any, none of you have any, you're all in ashes, covered. The, the only country, the only credit of nation left on this planet is the United States of America. We have surpluses. I agree that we have to recycle them, but we will recycle them in precisely the way we choose and whenever we choose. And we're not going to consult with you about it, and we're certainly not going to turn this recycling mechanism into a kind of United Nations of surplus recycling. It is indeed the case that from 1949 to 1950 onwards, the United States of America recycled 70% of its surpluses to Germany and to Japan. It's an astonishing number. 70% of profits made in this country were recycled into the industries of Europe and Japan. The Marshall Plan is just a very small part of it. I won't bore you now with details. But that was not an act of philanthropy. It's just like when... Boeing goes to Washington, it is not an act of philanthropy on the Pentagon's uh, part to instruct Boeing, Boeing Corporation, to build factories in the deficit states of the United States. It's just pragmatic economics. Unless the deficit regions are dollarized, that was the term used back in the 1950s by the United States um, federal government uh, functionaries, Unless Europe is dollarized, unless those who don't have dollars are given dollars to spend purchasing the net exports of those who have surpluses, then those who have surpluses will very soon stop having surpluses. So this is the surplus recycling mechanism. Thus we had the 20 years of the golden age of capitalism, the 1950s and the 1960s. A period with immense stability, very low unemployment, no price inflation, and universal growth. We had lots of other problems during that period, but at least from a macroeconomic point of view, it was a golden age, was it not? Now, why did it end? It ended because this global, sur global surplus recycling mechanism could no longer be sustained. Why? Because the United States of America, by the end of the 1960s, stopped having a surplus. So how can you uh, recycle a surplus if you don't have it? Well. Entering 1971, a young Turk, actually, it wasn't a Turk, it was an American, but you know what I mean. Uh, Paul Volcker, the name may ring a bell. In 1971, Paul Volcker was an unknown person working for an, another American, well, actually, yes, uh, Henry Kissinger, that you may have heard of, before he became Secretary of State, when he was still the National Security Advisor. Volcker's paper, which when I read a few years ago, I, th I thought it was perhaps the most remarkable document to have emerged from Washington in the last 50 years, 60 years or so, asked a very simple question. Now that America is losing its surplus position vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world, pr primarily Germany and Japan at the time, China had not emerged, of course, back then, uh, how are we going to retain our hegemony and dominance? And he gave a very concise and quite brilliant answer. If we can't recycle our own surpluses, we might as well recycle other people's surpluses. And this is precisely what has been happening between the mid-1970s and 2008. The United States of America, utilizing its trade deficit with the rest of the world, has been operating like a huge vacuum cleaner, sucking into the United States the net exports of Europe, of Japan, and, of course, later China. Thus, providing the net ex or exporters of Germany, of Japan, of China, with a requisite demand which is necessary to keep their factories going. 
So the ex ever-expanding trade deficit of the United States was not an accident. It was a very clever way of replacing one surplus recycling mechanism with another. The first one was the one where America had the surpluses and it was recycling them, with another one where the Amer America decided that instead of doing what Germany is doing at the moment, which is cutting its nose to spite its face, and therefore they're entering into a recession too because they're applying austerity upon themselves by cutting, 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 Volcker and Kissinger initially and Connolly, and then Volcker as the head of the Fed a bit later, had a different idea. We're going to expand our dominance and our wealth by expanding our deficits and using our deficits in order to provide the rest of the world with, is, with the demand which is necessary to keep their factories going, even at the expense of ours. And who's going to pay for the deficit? Because if I have an ever-expanding deficit at some point, the bank is going to tell me that, you know, it's game over. But if you are the United States of America and you have the reserve currency of the world and certain other factors that I will touch upon a bit later, what you can do is you can expand your deficits as long as you create the circumstances so that German entrepreneurs, Japanese entrepreneurs, later Chinese entrepreneurs, take their profit which they earn as a result of your deficits and they send it to Wall Street thus closing the cycle of the recycling loop. So, effectively, what we had is this. Between the 1940s and 1971, 72, 73, you had global surpluses being recycled from the United States to the rest of the world, to the capitalist world, the Western world. Okay? So, the United States had a, had, was, a, was a net exporter to Europe and to Japan, it was making profits, which was, it was then recycling to Europe and to Japan to keep them going so that they could keep buying its net exports. Once that surplus was lost and the surplus went shifted to Japan, to Germany and to China, the idea that Volcker had was we swap this, we just turn it on its head. And what we do is we expand our deficits so they can, they can expand their profits and that is self-sustaining to the extent that their profits come to the United States to finance our deficits. And this is precisely how it worked. The trouble was, and if you want we can discuss a bit later exactly how the capital gains, the profits of the Germans, the Japanese and later the Chinese, were attracted to the United States. There were some key elements to that. One was the immiseration of blue-collar blue workers in the United States because that kept prices low. And even though the oil crisis pushed prices up everywhere, prices in the United States rose more slowly than in, they did in Japan and in Europe. So if you were a Japanese or a German entrepreneur and you had profits, where do you invest them? Where do you keep them? Do you keep them in the place with a relatively low inflation rate? Uh, that's one reason. Uh, one mechanism that helped the United States attract the capital the profits from the rest of the world that closed that loop. Uh, Wall Street was another, with, with its amazing capacity to create metaphysical value out of nothing. Um, Walmart was another, because it promoted the ideology of cheapness, which for me is encapsulated so brilliantly in the one gallon jar of pickles that was selling for $2.79. Nobody needs a gallon of pickles in their fridge. I don't think you can actually fit one in there. So why was Walmart producing it? I think it was just a symbolic gesture to establish the importance of low prices as an end in themselves. And in the process, squeezing labor costs both here and elsewhere and creating the circumstances for profit rates to rise higher and faster than they did in Germany and in Japan so as to attract German and Japanese capital into the United States of America. Now, what do you think bankers do when you give them between three and five billion dollars every day net to play with, even if it's only for ten minutes a day, at nine o'clock in the morning, between nine and ten past nine? They get three to five billion dollars. This was the amount, this was the tsunami of capital that was coming from Europe and Asia on average, 
every working day, Monday to Friday, into Wall Street, three to five billion dollars, net, was flowing into the Wall Street banks. I'll tell you what they do. They find a way of making it grow for themselves, which is natural. I mean, you know, it's, it's in the nature of the beast. That's what bankers do. Now, we can spend countless hours discussing how they did it. One word captures the whole process. It's called financialization. I call it the production of private money, if you want toxic money. Because all those derivatives, swaps, paper titles that contained intricate and complicated and sophisticated forms of debt, effectively, started being utilized by banks as means of exchange and stores of value. They used them in order to exchange, exchange them amongst themselves and in order to store value that was going to the bankers in the form of bonuses and so on and so forth at some point when they cash their share options in. Now, what is it? How do we define something that works as a means of exchange and a store of value? It's money. So, effectively, bankers were given a license not to kill but to print. It was like uh, it was as if they were uh, they, they they managed to discover an ATM in their own living rooms that didn't what wasn't connected to any bank account. This and therefore, what did they do? I mean, if I had one of those, I would keep using it. Increasingly, I don't know about you, especially if nobody noticed. Okay? Um, you know, I mean, the trouble with crises like the one we have now is that there are multiple explanations for it. So you hear lots of people talking about regulatory capture, the fact that the, the, the Wall Street bankers captured the politicians and regulators, which is true and therefore they managed to avoid any serious regulation, or to have all the regulations that were set up by the New Dealers in the 1930s being swept away by people, awful people like Larry Summers and Mr. Rubin and Mr. Geithner in the 1990s under the Clinton administration. Um, it, that's true. People talk about greed. Greed is good. We had you know, Hollywood movies proclaiming that. Um, they try, I mean, Oliver Stone tried to portray this in order to warn against it. The result was that the Wall Street bankers were uh, imitating Mr. Gecko. So it's like war movies that create warmongers. Um, at the same time, you had another explanation which had to do with um, the way in which finance tapped into computing power in order to create exceptionally complex derivatives. All that is true, but what underlying this? And what's underlying the crisis of 2008 and the reason why the world economy has failed to recover since 2008, is that this surplus recycling mechanism, this very newfangled, weird, wonderful, audacious surplus recycling mechanism that Paul Volcker descri described in 1971, and which, which he helped put together as chairman of the Fed in the late 70s and early 80s, it broke down. In 2008, when Lehman Brothers went down, and all the others followed and had to be bailed out by you folks. What happened was that the United States of America lost its capacity to utilize its deficit, trade deficit, in order to recycle other people's profits. So if you look at the data now, since 2008, I've been doing it now in the context of writing the second edition of this book, which is out there, you find an astonishing empirical datum and that's the following. Today, the United States is producing 30% less demand for the rest of the world's manufacturers than it was in 2007. 30% is a very big reduction. And at the same time, remember the recycling? The rest of the world, whereas in 2007, they were financing United States corporations to the tune of $500 billion a year. Now they're taking out of it $50 billion. So that America is not producing demand for foreign manufacturers, and foreign manufacturers are not sending their profits to the United States of America. 56% reduction in the assets held by non-US residents in the United States since 2008. 56% reduction. So that loop, which was working 
so magnificently between the 1970s and 2008 has broken down. The reason why the United States is failing to recover, and the reason why Europe is in such a shambles, and the reason why the dragon is angst-ridden in China, is because we have lost about a trillion dollars worth every year of demand for manufacturing globally. And we've lost it because the surplus mechanism is broken. Now, the United States found, created one after 44, and recreated it in the 1970s, in a very strange way, in a very unbalanced way, but nevertheless did. Since 2008, we have not managed to regain our poise because that mechanism broke down. Now, this emphasis today in the United States public debate on debt is the homage that um, austerity pays to uh, misanthropy in order to maintain what I call the new regime that we live under, which is not capitalism. Capitalism died in 2008. Now, because you see, when I'm, I'm, an, I'm an old left winger, right? <laughs> so when, when I was growing up, I was having these very nice debates with my liberal, libertarian, right wing mates and professors and so on. So they were arguing that in favor of capitalism, the capitalism is like a jungle. It's a Darwinian struggle for the survival of the most efficient and the fittest. And the left was arguing that this is not so, but central planning is better, you know, because it's also more just, blah, 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 blah. Now, in 1991, the left died, when the Soviet Union and satellites collapsed. In 2008, capitalism died. Because if it's true that capitalism is, is a social Darwinist game that gives rise to the survival of the fittest, what's been happening since 2008? We have the, survivals, the survival of the most bankrupt. I call it bankruptocracy. <laughs> it's ruled not by banks, but by bankrupt banks. And the more bankrupt you are, the greater your power of extraction of wealth from the rest of society. So, this emphasis on debt is nothing more than a conspiracy in order to exploit ignorance and prejudice and fear. Because if I'm right in the proposition that I'm putting to you, that what we have here is a breakdown of surplus recycling, which has as a symptom a lot of debt and a lot of savings, and the two of them can't communicate with one another in order to wipe out one another, then this emphasis on debt is the revenge of Herbert Hoover, and nothing more than that. Because if we look at one of the Twin Peaks and not at the other, and we say, let's cut down debt, effectively all we'll manage to achieve is increase debt, like we're doing in Greece. In Greece, we have had the most brutal, most substantial fiscal squeeze in the history of humanity. If you look at the numbers, nowhere before has the budget been squashed so savagely. And what has happened to the debt? It's gone up from 121% to 200% of GDP. This is what happens. When you kill the cow that should produce the milk, you have no milk. And if you keep hitting it, it won't produce more. <laughs> so the problem now of the world economy and the United States economy is how do we start recycling global surpluses again in a rational way? Now, the great advantage of being a barbarian and of having no qualms about lying through your teeth as some politicians in this country, and in my country, in all countries, have been known to do, is that you can use simplification in order to confuse people. This story that we're trying to tell is quite complex. You know, when I'm in being interviewed by the media, you, know, you have about 20 seconds to answer the question, so what's wrong with the world? So, if you say, well, we have too much debt, the Chinese own it, so we become their slaves, like these awful advertisements prior to the election here. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's completely wrong. But, you know, you can just say it like this. It's, it's, it's over and done with. It's, it's exceptionally misleading and catastrophic. But nevertheless, it's a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, which you can tell in 20 seconds. My story, I've already been talking, you know, and fast for so, such a long time, and I still have not managed to piece it together fully. So when I was trying to tell this story some time ago, 
um, with Joseph Halevi, a very good colleague of mine and friend. Um, we were trying to think of a metaphor. And the metaphor I thought of was um, that of the Global Minotaur, which is the title of the book. Now, the one, one of the very few uh, advantages of being Greek is that we have a very a great wealth of mythologies, of myths from which to draw uh, little stories by which to tell the story about the world. So, I'm going to finish off with by reading one page out oh, here. This is what I've been trying to do here, and because I'm trying to save on paper, I have it on the phone. <laughs> um, it's a story of the global minotaur, which is effectively everything I've been saying so far. But what I'm going to read out is is very dear to my heart because. Um, one of the great joys of publishing this book was that um, it appealed to people that don't know anything about economics and therefore are much more sensible than we economists are. <laughs> and one such group of people were a, a group of graduates from the Royal College of the Arts in London who want to create an, an animated story out of my book. And they asked me to write the script. So allow me to read the script, it's only one page. And that's, that's how I'm going to finish and see if you can recognize in this little story, which is just dipping into Greek mythology for inspiration, the broader economic story that I have been relating to you so far. Okay, so here we go. Once upon a time, in the famous maze-like labyrinth of the Cretan king's palace, there lived a creature as fierce as it was tragic. Its intense loneliness comparable only with the fear it inspired far and wide. You see, the Minotaur, for this was its name, had a voracious appetite which could only be satiated in order to guarantee the king's reign by means of human flesh. The king, the ironclad Minon, who secured peace, was the one that enabled trade to crisscross the high seas in bountiful ships and spread prosperity's benevolent reach to all corners of the known world. Alas, the beast's appetite could only be satiated by human flesh. Every now and then, a ship loaded with youngsters sailed from faraway Athens, bound for Crete, to deliver its human tribute to be devoured by the Minotaur in his labyrinth. A gruesome ritual that was essential, however, for preserving the era's peace and for reproducing trade and prosperity. Millennia later, another, this time a global minotaur, rose up. Surreptitiously, from the ashes of the first post-war phase, the one created by America's New Dealers, from the ashes of the war. Its lair, the global minotaur's lair, a form of labyrinth, was located deep in the guts of America's economy. It took the form of the United States trade deficit, which consumed the world's exports. The more the deficit grew, the greater its appetite for Europe's and Asia's capital with which this American minotaur satiated its hunger. What made it truly global was its function. It helped recycle financial capital, profits, <coughs> savings, surplus money. It kept the gleaming German factories busy. It gobbled up everything produced in Japan and later in China. And to complete the circle, the foreign and often the American owners of these distant factories sent their profits, their cash, to Wall Street, a form of modern tribute to the global minotaur. What do bankers do when such a tsunami of capital comes their way daily, when between three and five billion dollars net passes through their fingers every morning of each week? They find ways to make it grow, to breed on their behalf. Thus, the 1980s, the 1990s, and the noughties saw an explosion of private money minting by Wall Street on the back of the daily capital tsunami that flowed to America to feed the global minotaur. Just like its mythological predecessor, our global minotaur kept the world economy going for decades. Until, that is, the pyramids of private money built upon the minotaur's feeding tribute collapsed under the their own impossible weight. Planet Earth was simply not large enough to hold so much private, toxic money. Money like paper that burned down once the collapse began. 
In this conflagration, the global minotaur was wounded critically. While in rude health, the minotaur produced tremendous wealth and despicable inequality, new vistas of pleasure and new forms of deprivation, ample security for a few and cripple, crippling insecurity for most, great inventions and gadgets and spectacular failures of common decency. Whatever we think of the global minotaur's reign, it kept the world going and its elites thinking that their regime was stable, successful, moderate even. With the Minotaur out of sight, keeping the show going from its secret labyrinth, its gross excesses remained out of sight, helping the great and the good, read Ben Bernanke, <laughs> believe their own rhetoric about some great moderation that was supposedly the order of the day. But when the Minotaur killed over, mortally wounded by the excess of its handmaidens in Wall Street, it left the global economy in disarray. In America and in Europe, in India and in China, the Minotaur's demise has put the world into a permanent crisis. The Cretan Minotaur was slain by a brave Athenian called Theseus. Its death, if you may recall, ushered in the new era of tragedy, history, philosophy. Our very own global Minotaur died less heroically, a victim of Wall Street bankers. What will its demise bring? Should we dare hope for a new era in which wealth no longer needs poverty to flourish? In which development means fewer ashes and abstract power wanes while everyone gets stronger? Whatever the result of history's mysterious ways, the global Minotaur will be remembered as a remarkable beast whose 30-year reign created and then destroyed the illusion that capitalism can be stable, greed a virtue, and finance productive. Thank you. Right, questions. I think I'm going to moderate myself. Okay, you have to line up against that microphone, I think. This is the way we do it here, isn't it? Thanks for a really uh, crystal clear, brilliant vision of where we've been. Could you elaborate a little more on where you think we're going with all this? <laughs> Very briefly, I think that we are in a state of sustained bewilderment. Because, let's face it, in the 19... 30s, the New Deal, despite some early successes, failed. By 1937-38, we had the Second Great Depression. And it was only the war that managed to do the recycling that the New Deal eventually failed to accomplish as a result of FDR's backtracking. Now we have a world economy which, conceivably, technically, it's quite straightforward to uh, plug the gaps and the black holes. The G20 could easily agree on a plan very similar to that which John Maynard Keynes was suggesting in 1944. But it's very unlikely that they will. Europe is a comedy of errors. Our European leaders are competing with one another as to who is going to prove more idiotic. <laughs> and they are so entrenched in their positions and so parochial, they can't see beyond their own little squabbles. They have a horizon of eight months for the next federal election in Germany, for instance. And Europe, therefore, is the sick person of Europe, of Europe, that's Greece, of the world. Um, meanwhile, the United States of America is ungovernable because you have a, a constitution that you cherish in this country which is as if it was created in order to turn this country into an ungovernable state. So you have Congress, White House, loggerheads, cancelling each other out, so how could the president, whoever the president might be, lead in the G20, like Truman and Roosevelt were doing before? Um, and you have China trying its best to stimulate its economy, but finding it impossible to provide the missing demand that the West has um, done away with. So, I have no answer to your question. Bewilderment. My question is about consumer demand 
and the extent to which the old system depended upon it, and if we don't have it to the same degree, could there possibly be a new economy? And so I don't know how to say all these in right economic terms, but I'm just going to say what I'm thinking and then see what you make out of it, is that it seems like all the economies got to a point where it had to be based on growth. It couldn't just be sustainable, it had to grow. And so that meant more consumers. And, and so then that led to a lot of things ecologically that weren't good for the earth and things that people did to maximize profit and reduce their costs and all these things. And so uh, that's one thing. Is there the possibility that there might be a new economy that's not based on growth? Second, if you don't have consumer demand at the same level that you used to, and of course I think that's why one of those little pieces you talked about was the capital came here, that's because of Americans are incredible consumers, way more than Europeans. I mean, I went in Ross dress for less today, there's so much junk in there and Americans will buy it and other people, other economies won't. So that's another piece is, what if consumer demand has changed? And then the third thing is, in my own work, I deal with a lot of people that are getting divorced and can't pay their mortgages. And for the first time, I have seen people say, we just stop paying our mortgage. And that would be unthinkable. Previously, people would do anything to save their home and their credit. Mm -hmm. And now people don't care all the time. They're saying, we're just going to stop paying our mortgage, and they do. And so I think consumers' attitudes about consumption and debt mm -hmm are really different as a result of this crisis. So if you put all that okay. together, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> Do we have a couple of hours? Um, <laughs> Carol, the, it's, it's very important to draw a distinction that most economists do not draw, or haven't been drawing for a very long time. And this, is, uh, this, is, this, this has been a calamity for the planet Earth. A distinction between growth and development. It's one thing to say we need development, and quite another thing to, 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 to say we want growth. Okay? So growth has been the, the catchphrase for the last 30, 40 years, at the expense often of development. So I don't believe in growth of everything. I don't believe in growth of uh, CO2 or CO or you know, poison or toxic derivatives. I believe that we should have serious recession in these markets, in these sectors. Serious recession of these sectors, right? But I do believe in education. I believe that we shouldn't have less efficient education systems. In other words, uh, smaller classes. You know, we don't want high productivity schools because that, that they produce morons. Um, you know, the, the great and the good want their kids to have one-to-one -one tutorials. I don't see why the rest of society shouldn't aspire to the same thing. Um, you mentioned something that I disagree with. The, the reason why American consumers consume more than Europeans is not because of some kind of fundamental cultural difference. I think that what you have is a situation where firstly, I mean, in the 1950s, America was the only country that had been effectively untouched by the war. So you had you know, the first washing machines, the first consumption goods and durables being produced here. But it's natural that the Americans would be the first to enjoy them but after that, what you have in around 1973-1974 is a massive reduction in the real wage, the real median wage in the United States. I don't know whether you know that, but today we have not reached in this country a median real wage which is anywhere near what it was in 1972. So you have um, what happened effectively between the mid-1970s and 2008 was that Living standards were being pushed into the ground. Working hours expanded immensely for people to make ends meet, since real wage, hourly wages were declining, they were working longer hours. That put enormous strain on families. Um, I, I have, uh, my sociologist friends and colleagues tell me that this has played a very significant role in the very fast rise in divorce rates in the, in the United States. And you have an attempt, and I, I feel that sometimes in my own life, of you know, substituting or attempting to substitute for the loss of quality with quantity. So, you know, the Walmart phenomenon goes in there. That's why I mentioned the pickles. Who gives a damn about one gallon of pickles, right? But 
it's there. It's, I have a psychoanalytic view of that. It's a poor person who's, who struggles all day at work and who feels exploited and works for nothing, has to travel huge distances and work much longer hours, and you know, goes into Walmart, buys one of those jars, and feels that they've managed to steal somebody else's labor. And that is very alienating. And the, the, this, this kind of consumerism, which substitutes qualities with quantities, which destroys the environment, which creates circumstances of a diminution of actual living standards, and tries to substitute them with more things in the, in, in the shed. This is a result of that global surplus recycling mechanism, which required the squeezing of the daylights out of blue-collar works in the United States to keep prices low, or the rate of price inflation lower than in Germany or Japan, in order to keep the capital coming in here, in order, however, to keep the German and Japanese factories going. So, I don't believe in pointing moralizing figures at anyone. We've, we're all part of this system that we've created over the last few decades, which, you know, <coughs> met its nemesis because of its hubris. I'd like to ask uh, three questions. Uh, one is to summarize uh, briefly what did happen in Greece in, in relationship to the rest of the world, why Greece went further down. Uh, number two is if you would please summarize maybe an alternative approach, what could, let's say, for example, uh, former Prime Minister Karmanis and Papandreou could have done instead of what they did. And number three is, I'm an enthusiast of something called the Hamiltonian economic system from 1789 to 1910, actually created a great America before America became global power. Could that help Greece? Yes, it could. But let me answer your questions starting at the beginning. Um, so what happened in Greece? Well, we created the Eurozone. Look, let me put it this way. Our country, because you come from Greece too, has been monopolizing the headlines for three years. There is something wrong with the world if this can happen. Imagine if a fiscal crisis in the great state of Delaware could bring the United States down. I think you would agree, if I were to say, to suggest to you, that that would be an indication that there is something wrong with, not with Delaware, but, but with the United States of America. So if little pipsqueak Greece can create problems and can monopolize the headlines, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and so on, for so long, this is just an indication that there is something wrong with the world global system, right? It's not Greece's fault. It's like saying that, oh, there is this snowflake that started in avalanche. That snowflake is to blame. Even if you removed that snowflake surgically prior to the avalanche, the avalanche would still have happened. Now, Greece has always flirted with debt implosions. You know, we've um, defaulted a number of times over the last century. Um, we've done it again last March. If Greece was not part of the Eurozone, it would not be in the headlines. If Greece was not part of the Eurozone in 2008, it would have had... Um, a, a, a severe recession for a year or two, it will be growing back again now. In, with its all, all its malignancies, its corruption, its tax evasion, all the rubbish which is part of our country, okay, would not be enough to stop the recovery from happening. If, if, we've done this before. We did it in the 70s, we had it, did it in the 50s, we did it in the 1930s. But when you lock yourself into a kind of gold standard, because that's what the Eurozone is, it's a gold standard. You see, let me bore you a bit with, with, with a story on, on, on the Eurozone and the Euro crisis, which is, how, however, very intimately connected with the story that I've been telling you here today. When the global minotaur was happening, when the global surplus recycling mechanism was functioning, the United States of America was single-handedly responsible for generating enough demand for Germany to be a, a great net exporter and not to have to worry about demand for its Mercedes-Benzes and Siemens equipment. Right. Germany was a net exporter within the Eurozone and without the Eurozone. And as long as that happened, the whole of the Eurozone could keep sailing on like a beautiful riverboat on the Pacific of Ocean. But when the storm of 2008 hits, a riverboat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is not going to fare very well. It will start sinking. And the people above look at the people below on the decks and say, 
Why are you allowing water to, 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 to seep in? And we are going to punish you and waterboard you, fiscally. This is what has happened to Greece now. It's being fiscally waterboarded. Right? Thinking that they can escape. Uptex. It's, it's complete madness. It not having learned the lessons of the 1920s and 1930s. We're repeating all the problems with ghosts. Now, uh, what could the Greek governments have done? Well, you mentioned two Greek prime ministers. One was Karamanlis. This was in 2004 to 2009. You see, in Greece, Greece has had a very interesting experience with debt since 1974, after the restoration of parliamentary democracy. Governments, regardless of which party was in government, would step on the accelerator to create some kind of flimsy growth, ponzi growth. At some point, it would become clear that we had a cliff, and, you know, the, 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 our debt situation would get too much, and then it would hit the, the brakes. And, you know, austerity, which create increased unemployment a bit, but nevertheless, the debt was manageable. We kept doing this up until 2004. The, the, the period 2000-2004 was an accelerated period, the period because of the Olympics. The next government should have been the one that pressed on the brakes again. But unfortunately, the Karamanlis government kept the foot firmly on the accelerator. Why? Because German capital was flowing into the country at dirt cheap interest rates, financing all these black holes, all, the, all these, these Ponzi schemes. And it, they were actually, you know, just like the subprime market here, where people were being effectively coerced to take loans that they couldn't afford, similarly in Greece. So you had Siemens executives coming to Greece, bribing Greek politicians to take on more loans from Deutsche Bank in order to buy Siemens goods and build more motorways. The Greek government then should have said no, of Karamanlis. Then 2008 hits. Mr. Karamanlis, the conservative prime minister at the time, because he's not a stupid man, he was a terrible prime minister, but he was not a stupid man, he noticed what was going on. And you know what he did? He bailed out. He has not spoken since. He effectively called for a general election, which he did not contest. Effective, you know, much worse than Obama's first debate with Romney. He would <laughs> appear in front of a microphone and go, mm, yeah, all right, don't vote for me, and he would step up. <laughs> he lost that election. He didn't have to call for that election. He called it to lose it, to stay at home. He has not spoken since. He's having a nice holiday. Right? <laughs> and then we had Papandreou, whom I had the terrible experience of being an advisor to, but up until 2006, so I'm not to blame for what happened after, um, who unfortunately did not even see it coming. He did not see the crisis coming. He did not see that the Eurozone was collapsing, and the, you know, it's like, like having a built a skyscraper, that's the Eurozone, without foundations, then there's the earthquake, and it starts unraveling at the flimsiest part of the edifice, which is Greece. Now, let's say that between 1995 and 2008, God and his angels had descended upon Athens and ran the show. Hmm? With rationality, with uh, omniscience, with uh, um, ethos and morality. Greece would not have been the first domino to fall, but it would have been the third. The way it happened now is Greece fell first, then Ireland, then Portugal, now Italy and Spain. Who would have fallen after Ireland, or possibly after Portugal? But once you're locked into that edifice that was never designed to sustain a crisis like that of 2008, you're doomed. And finally, the United States is, that we know today is the result of the crisis of the 19th century and the early 20th century. And of course the last one would be 1929. Hamilton was the one that very presently saw that unless there is a surplus recycling mechanism between the states, the southern and the northern states. And until the, there is a commonality of debt which affects this recycling of debt, there would be no such thing as a single nation that is sustained. So you, you had crises that led to gradual, discrete, continental consolidation from the Pacific to the Atlantic in this country. Many Europeans like to imagine or to hope that this crisis in Europe 
is also going to lead to continental consolidation in the United States of Europe. I don't see it happening for reasons that I won't bore you with now. But it would be nice if Hamilton could be revived in, in Europe. I have a couple of questions and a comment. Um, what do you see in terms of inflation or deflation? My guess would be inflation. And the second is, um, for the average personal investor, uh, what would you advise? My, my take is like treasury, inflation protected securities are a pretty good way to go. Um, and um, the last question, the last comment is that doesn't, shouldn't Greece focus on tax collection? <laughs> Let me start with the last part before I give you personal financial advice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Greece certainly should focus on uh, dealing with not so much tax evasion, but what I call tax immunity. Because, you know, the powers that be in Europe has always managed to negotiate with the political class a very cozy uh, system of tax immunity. They don't even have to pay tax. They don't even have to evade tax. The tragedy is that when you have an economy like Greece's going to a tailspin and you have a massive diminution in national income and the simultaneous breakdown in the circuits of credit so that the bank system is effectively defunct, it's kaput, you can't really improve your tax collection methods because there is no income to tax. People that just don't make money anymore. Even the rich don't make money. Or, I mean, they've already taken the, what money they've already accumulated to Geneva or to Frankfurt or to Wall Street, but then they're not making because, they, they, you know, the, the circular flow of income has been interrupted. So how can you improve your tax mechanism when there is no income to tax? So that's the second question. The first question, I'm not worried about inflation at all. Um, you see, in, in, in this country there is this uh, fixation with... Uh, quantitative easing, Mr. Bernanke's attempt to stabilize the American economy. And there is a fallacy that uh, does the rounds, and which I have encountered ever since you know, we, we came to this country, that Mr. Bernanke is printing money. He's not printing money. Quantitative easing is not an increase in the supply of money. If it were, you could be talking about potential increases in the rate of inflation. But what exactly is quantitative easing? I mean, I wish he printed money and gave it to consumers to buy things that they need and to pay down their debt. Yeah, that, that would not be inflationary if they used helicopter money, as they say, in order to pay down debt. Because that it does not, doesn't get added into the circular flow of income. It's just that it relieves negative equity problems. But he's not doing that. Even though he wants, and that's why some people refer to him as Helicopter Ben, he, uh, he, before he became chairman of the Fed, he said that it would be a good idea in the middle of a great recession to do that. But what he that does is this. If, when he buys um, more mortgage-backed securities from J.P. Morgan, right? effectively what he does is he creates uh, an overdraft account with the Fed from which the um, J.P. Morgan can draw in order to pass these MBSs to another bank. J.P. Morgan does not have the capacity to take this money and lend it to you. So that does not add to the money supply. The only way he can add to the money supply through QE is if there is an amazing equilibrium of optimism amongst bankers, because one has to, to use the overdraft facility provided by the Fed to, uh, to buy MBSs from the other, and at the same time, uh, developers must feel that as a result of this, interest rates are going to fall sufficiently for house buyers to order new homes from them, so they can make use of those loans that Bank X will get from Bank Y as a result of This coincidence of optimism is nowhere to be found in this equilibrium of fear that we're experiencing. And as long as we live in an equilibrium of fear, there's not going to be any inflation because the money supply is not increasing. You know, Bernanke would love to be able to print money. He can't. QE is not money printing. So my criticism of QE and Bernanke 
is that what he's trying to do is to create a new bubble in mortgage backed security. So take this toxic. You see, we say we, we talk about uh, toxic derivatives. They're not really toxic derivatives. What they are, they are derivatives, paper titles with toxic prices, very low prices. So he's trying to create a bubble to, 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 to increase their value so that they start selling, pushing down interest rates. But he's not succeeding in doing this. Uh, so it's not quantitative easing even. It's, I call it price easing, but that's another, another matter. I'm not giving you advice on what to buy. I don't want you to blame me. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, but there will be a book signing, and you're welcome to join the signing line if you have further questions or comments. Thank you so much for speaking today. Thank you.